Make your mind. You're listening to the Pool Boy Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Pool Boy Podcast. I'm Steve and on this episode we are once again delving into Commonwealth Games history and getting the recollections of a swimmer who is the most successful English female athlete at the Games. Someone with 13 medals including 4 golds won across 4 games. You may have worked it out already but let's find out who today's guest is. More Commonwealth memories on this episode of the Pool Boy Podcast and joining me for this uh, discussion, this review, uh, to give me her reminiscences, Karen Pickering, welcome. Hi, it's nice to be here. Well, um, now you're someone with a lot of history in the Commonwealth Games, you went to four, um, we won't try and get through all four, um, but we'll, we'll have a look at them all and, and take a, a deeper dive into a couple of them. But before we do that, um, what's your kind of overall feeling about the Commonwealth Games? I mean, you went to four Olympics, you went to the Europe, European Championships, World Championships, you know, won medals in all of them. Um, you know, what? how does the Commonwealth Games fit into all that for you? Um, the, the Commonwealth is my first memory, really, of watching a sporting event. So I know for some people it was um, it's an Olympic Games, but for me it was the 82 Commonwealth in, in, um, in Brisbane. And I did a school project on it. So I remember, um, you know, having to draw the logo and um, writing up about some of the swimmers like June Croft and Phil Hubble. Um, and so um, that was quite a, a big, big event for me, I suppose. So the, the Commonwealth Games was was always really important um, because I'd watched it on TV and just thought, oh, my God, this is amazing. I want to be part of this. So that was sort of my first um really like memories of, of being driven and wanting to be part of it before then maybe seeing the, the 84 um, Commonwealth or, um, or, um, Olympics rather. I remember a little bit of the 80 Olympics, but it was the, it was the 82 Commonwealth that, that really um, was the massive highlight for me as a kid watching sport. So you got, you got your chance to, to swim in them fairly early in your international career I think I think if I'm right it was your second um, senior meet when you went to Auckland in 1990 uh, I think you swam the, the Europeans the year before um, that's a long way to go um, but uh, what do you recall of that experience yeah I actually my first major championship was 87 at the um, European championships oh, crikey, there you go. Um, as a as a little Good yeah fact checking a little thing and then um, 89 um, Europeans as well um, so yeah, it was it was massively exciting. It was quite, it was a big deal because it was it it was in Auckland. It was in New Zealand. Um, I had to do some reorganising sort of life plans in some ways because it was going to be it would be early in the year because it it being in the southern hemisphere. So um, the games were I think around February time from from what I can vaguely remember now. Um, and that was going to really impact when my A-levels were going to be. So I had to make a choice whether to do my A-levels in a year or three years because it wasn't going to be feasible to do them in two. We didn't have iPads and mobile phones or anything, so I couldn't study um, like you can now and you couldn't take exams in, you know, in the same way that you can now. So it just wasn't feasible for me to do it in two years um, with the goal of, of going to Auckland. So I made the decision to do my A-levels in a year. So they were done and dusted. Um, and then, um, yeah, had, um, Auckland as, as a, a big goal for, for that year. Um, and it was just really exciting. I mean, the, the opportunity to go to New Zealand, um, uh, and then be, be part of the Commonwealth, like I'd said, had been such a, a massive part of my, um, dream of being a swimmer so to to get the opportunity to go to Auckland was huge and and I'm going to tread carefully now having got that first fact wrong but I think it was possibly your first senior international medals he says hopefully with, um, uh, with a couple of relay medals in Auckland yes yeah yes it would have been so we, we, I think we were uh, we were just outside the medals at the Europeans in um, Bonn in 89 I'm it's a long time ago I'm like having to <laughs> working up here um yeah so um <clears throat> I think I was fifth or sixth in the individual in um 
in Bonn at the Europeans, but <clears throat> I didn't swim the 200 then. I was a 50 hundred swimmer at that point. I hadn't progressed up to the 200. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when I went to the Commonwealth in Auckland, it was for the 100 mainly, the two relays. And I think I may have swam a 50 if it was even on the program then. I'm not even sure they did a, because 92 Olympics, yeah. uh, they had it. 88, I think they brought it into the, into the program. Prior to that, it hadn't been. Yeah. Um, the 50 freestyle wasn't on the program so yeah so it was um it was my first medals and I think actually going out there um you know I kind of knew that our relays would have a good chance I didn't really realize that I would ha I would be in with a shout of a medal and um, I finished fourth in the hundred um but it was a bit of a it was a bit of a shock to be out there and realize that I was a um, a medal contender if you like individually well, uh, you came back with uh, a bronze in the 4x1 and a, and a silver in the medley relay, I think. Um, yeah. But uh, is there anything you recall from that competition that, that stands in memory? And, I, you know, as you say, it was a long time ago. But, uh, you know, anything that, that you look back on now fondly? Um, lots of things. I mean, the, the first experience of a multi-sport game, so going to watch um, other sports, um, the rivalry between Australia and England in particular... Um, that was kind of my first experience of it and um, I just reveled in it I loved it there were some fantastic performances it was sort of Hayley um, <gasps> I forgot her surname now Hayley Lewis Hayley Lewis oh my goodness sorry yeah it was Hayley Lewis <laughs> where she, it was her breakthrough I mean she was only gosh, she must have she was a young teenager and also Alison Higson from Canada it was her kind of breakthrough meet as well and so you had these these young kids that I was kind of seeing swim, thinking, my goodness, you know, they're already younger than me. How many years have I got left in the sport with these kids coming through already? Um, but then you had Lisa Curry Kenny, as she was then, who won the 100 freestyle, who, you know, went onto the podium with her kids. So you had these real extremes in sport, I guess, of like what you can do when you're older and more experienced and also these young, fearless kids coming through and swimming amazing events. Um, and yeah, the Australians on the 1500 were extraordinary. I just remember being, you know, amazed by the depth they had and how fast that race was. Um, but yeah, and it was interesting sort of staying in, um, we were sort of in these houses, sort of temporary houses um, type accommodation. So being like that rather than a hotel than I was used to staying in and going to a massive dining hall um, the first experience of Orbis on a very small scale, what it was like to be in a, a village. Mm -hmm. um, so there were lots of little things that were really great experience leading on to an Olympic Games. Um, but it was it was much less stressful. It was much lower pressure. Um, although, you know, obviously there is that rivalry, like I said, which um, which has gone on throughout my career. Um it, it was just it, it was just really special. And I remember going off the 10 metre platform with Bobby Morgan, who won the high diving for Wales. He won the 10 metre diving. Um, and I remember at the closing ceremony at the pool jumping off that and I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> I think far. there are lots of, people, lots of people who would agree with you uh, not to jump yeah, off that, the 10 metre platform. But um, yeah, I said yeah. we were going to we were going to kind of focus on a couple of your your games in in bit more detail so let's jump on four yeah. years to um to victoria in in canada now you obviously went into mm -hmm. that in a very different place in your career you've been to an olympics in between you'd won the the short course 200 free world title the year before um so did you head to, to those games with a lot of confidence you know expecting to do well um i think i, I felt confident but i wasn't um favorite to win um, so I was swimming the 100 and the 200 um, at those games, plus the three relays. Um, and it was, it was one of those ones where, um, uh, well, first of all, I, f I felt a little bit of pressure because I'd been awarded an MBE after winning the World Championships. And I felt like I had to live up to it now. So um, there, was, there was definitely, I hadn't actually collected it, I don't think, at the point where I went to the Commonwealth Games. So I hadn't been to the Palace to get it. So I felt like I really needed to still um, earn it. Um, but also, um, Australia had said they were going to win every women's event at those Commonwealth Games. And that had been in the press. And, um, you know, that was a big deal. And of course, they had a, a very, very strong team. Um, so they'd made this statement and the 100 free 
freestyle was the first race of those um, Commonwealth. So it was really, really special to ruin that for them and to, to win the, the first race. There was a huge delay before the race. There was a problem with the electronic timing. So we had quite a significant, maybe 30, 40 minute delay before we swam the race, um, which obviously just, you know, gets your nerves going. You're not quite sure when you're going to swim. It messes up when you've warmed up all the rest of it. So um, I was quite proud of how I dealt with, with all of that. But yeah, it was it was really, really special to win that first race. And then, in fact, the second race was won by a Canadian freestyler as well. So Australia obviously went on to have a great games, but it was we kind of high fived each other <laughs> that we'd done that on the first two races on the first on the first day. Well, I think I think you were the only um, non-Australian to win an individual gold in the in the women's. Um, but you know, you went on um, to 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 get another gold. I mean, we'll come back onto the two hundred free in a minute, maybe. But you went on to to have another gold in the in the four by one free as well, which must have been another nice kind of experience to put one over on the Aussies <laughs> again in that sprint kind of field. Yeah, it was great, and I think that's that was where my real love of anchoring the team set in because I dived in I think maybe in third and then um, overtook and we took got the goals um, and obviously that's a lot to do with the order that people swim swim their teams in but I loved that chasing the swimmer down and you know I was always stronger in the second half of my races so I was kind of you know, had to be a little bit strategic in how I swam them. But, you know, I still you know, can remember coming off that last wall and absolutely hammering the turn um, and then going past to, to get gold. So, yeah, that's where that's where my love of like that chasing down in relays came from. So it was, as I said, it was your most successful Commonwealth Games. You picked up five medals. We've talked about the two golds. Yeah, you had a silver in the medley relay as well. And then uh, you kind of moved up from that 50, 100 to 100, 200. So you had the 200 free in, in those um, in, in those games as well. Uh, what do you remember about, about that race? I remember really struggling. I think it was the next day. It was I had the 100 freestyle um, and I think think it was possibly the next morning so because of the massive delay and having to do drug tests I got back quite late um, and then I, I think it was the next day that I was swimming the 200 and I was really struggling so um, I was very fatigued I hadn't recovered very well um, and then you know had to go again in the 200 which was you know still a fairly new event for me in terms of experience at racing it at a, at a high level and um, it, it just didn't go as well as I would have wanted. Um, I was I went to see the nutritionist um, while I was there and we worked really hard to just try and get me back on track. Um, and so that I was able to then, you know, be recovered and, and race um, in the relays, which which went much better. Um, but, yeah, I was I was struggling quite a lot on that second day. And I think winning on the first day. You know, I'd never, maybe I hadn't come down, but I struggled to sleep um, and I just wasn't, I wasn't at my best, unfortunately, on day two. Just didn't quite get that right. Well, you still came away with a, with a bronze yeah, in that, um, in, in that event. And I, w I want to say, I mean, well, from what I can remember watching, you know, Victoria on the, on the TV at the time, it, it seemed to be like it was a team that, that was having a lot of fun you know, while they were there. I mean, is that, is that a fair reflection? Um, and yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't I mean don't... that in a bad way. I mean, they were taking yeah. it seriously, but, you know, they seem to be enjoying, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, uh, the, the I think there was definitely great team atmosphere, atmosphere. I think there always is at the Commonwealth. All the games that I remember, there's great team spirit. And quite often you have um, some of the athletes from other sports that are down poolside um, cheering on with the team. And it, and it just feels feels different to other major championships. Um, I don't know if it would be, yeah, by, by fun, I know what you mean, like that there's just a good atmosphere, but also it's a really big team. So, um, you know, because it's three per event and um, quite often the selections were just, they would take three per event um, at the championships before they started having much tougher 
criteria to make the teams. So the teams were huge as well. So there was a lot of people, which meant there was always a lot of people not swimming. So there'd always be a lot of people poolside. Um, and so there was great atmosphere. And that's obviously across all the teams. It was just, there was a lot of us in, in each of the groups, which made for um, great atmosphere, I think. So you came off, off that meet, as I said, with five medals. Um, and and it's kind of relevant for what's happening this year with the calendar being all over the place. But you went almost pretty much straight from there to the World Championships in Rome. I think, you know, two weeks later or possibly a bit less than that later. How did you manage that transition? Um, yeah, that was quite, that was really hard because um, there weren't many of us going on to the World Championships. There was only a handful of swimmers that actually went from um, Victoria on to, on to Rome. So it was that I remember that being pretty hard and something that I'd, I'd not really had to do before. And obviously going from, you know, um, Canada to, to Europe um, was was quite a trek. But, um, yeah, there was definitely a part of me that would have you know relished just being able to actually enjoy being at the Commonwealth Games and soak it in rather than have to just, you know, just park it and move on to the to the next event. Um, I think there are times when, you know, certainly later in my career that I feel like I didn't stop and appreciate what I'd done enough. And sometimes you just can't because you have to move on to the next competition so quickly. But it was hard and there there just wasn't the the same support that you have now in terms of, um, you know, physiology and psychology. Um, like I said, I had some great nutritional support from Peggy Wellington in, in Victoria, who really enabled me to get through that meet. Um, but we, we didn't have, you know, towards the end of my career, we started to have the physiologists and that support. But we just didn't have that. You kind of just had to get on with it. Um, and we didn't really, you know, know the effects of jet lag and how to how best to get over it. So we were often you were just you know, doing the best you could or, um, you know, getting some advice off other coaches or other swimmers as to how best to deal with it. But certainly, you know, I'm sure that if the swimmers have to do that now, they have a heck of a lot more information and support and guidance and backup to be able to do go from meet to meet and survive it and, you know, and relish it and thrive um, going from race to race. Well, I, mean, I think you know, this year, obviously, the British contingent have the advantage of everything being in Europe so uh, they have the jet lag yeah. to, to, uh, to contend with but as you say <laughs> yeah. they have a lot of support for them um, b- before we leave before we leave Victoria is there anything that, that sticks in the mind from that meet you mentioned in the context of Auckland that the Australian depth in the 1500 and, and something I remember is, is Kieran Perkins breaking the world record in the 1500 and practically lapping the rest of the, the field but was there anything that that, that st- sticks with you that you remember seeing um, I think one of the, the things I remember was that, that it was integrated. So we had some um, para swimmers on the squad um, and that hadn't happened from what I remember in Auckland. So um, uh, or it was much more integrated in, in um, Victoria. And that, that was nice for us. You know, that was that was really interesting. And actually to to be part of the team together, I thought was really good. Um, and, you know, obviously it's not feasible in the Olympics when they swim so many different categories and races so it was tough for those for some of the the para swimmers because it was only a handful of of events and categories that were included but um it was great to be part of that team as well um but you know I kind of the the training camp in Vancouver was amazing absolutely loved it and I knew I felt good I remember <clears throat> the camp going well and feeling good off the back of it um the other sort of I guess memory for me that's special now is that um my mum and dad and my sister and a couple of my um mum and dad's friends were there my sister had slept in an airport one night waiting for my parents to arrive because she was so determined to be there um and I just remember you know my mum and dad being there to to support me and um actually getting to to see that race um they hadn't been out in Palmer for the uh, for the world championship so for them to actually be there and for me to win that first race was was really really special and um my dad died three years ago nearly four years ago and so there are some competitions that have a real strong tie-in to him um my parents went on for 
after and had an amazing holiday, which they always said was the best holiday they ever had. So the whole kind of experience of, of those Commonwealths is really special for more than just the swimming. I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, was a great uh, feeling to have them there. Let's, let's jump on four years. Kuala Lumpur in 1998, a very different lead in for you for that one, because uh, as I understand it, you were coming back from having broken your back in, a, in an accident in the, in the intervening years. So uh, whereas yeah. you may have gone to, to Victoria with a lot of confidence, maybe not so much going to, to Malaysia. Yeah, you could say that. Um, so in 96, in November, I broke my back in a car accident and um, <clears throat> it had been, it was a real tough to work my way back. <clears throat> I didn't actually ever miss a major championship, um, but I was not at my best. I, and it was beyond um, KL before I was actually back to full training. Um, but what, what I really, really struggled with, with was the mental side. So because my confidence always came from standing behind the blocks and kind of knowing I'd done the work, you know, and feeling like, right, I've done all the work, I've done this, I've got a job to do. Um, I, leading up to KL, when I stood behind the block, I was at the point where I, I didn't think I could finish 200 metres. So I, I thought that I was going to have to be rescued. I thought I would actually stop it. it it's really irrational. But I, I stood, when I stood behind the blocks, I genuinely thought I'm not going to finish four lengths. Um, <clears throat> so for this 200 freestyle in the heats, the same thing was going through my head. I'm not going to finish it. I'm not going to finish it. And so I was very, very cautious. So I was always stronger in the back end, but I was just leaving myself so much to do and being so cautious. Um, and I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified of swimming a 200 freestyle. Um, and I swam the heats of the 200 and I qualified in seventh or eighth for the final. And I went to the swim down pool and I made the decision in the swim down pool that this just had to stop. Like I just I could couldn't go on. Something had to happen. And so the decision I made through my swim down was that in the final, I was going to go out as fast as I possibly could and see what happened because I needed to prove that I could finish <laughs> regardless. So I just said to myself, right, I'm just going to go out as fast as I can. And then what happens, happens. And if I can't finish, I can't finish. Um, and so I, and that's how I was. So I stood behind lane one, I think it was, or it was one or eight. I can't remember now. Um, just thinking as soon as the gun goes, I'm absolutely going flat out which is what I did. And I led the race for 195 metres and Susie O'Neill overtook me for the gold in the last five metres. So I just couldn't quite hold on. But that was a turning point for me because after that, I, was, I had my, my confidence back. And once I had another sort of year of getting back to full training, then it started to all kind of come back together. But, you know, up to that point, it was, it was so irrational um, so it was, a, it was a big turning point race for me, that, um, that 200. Well, there were three silvers for you in, in, in Kuala Lumpur. So off that, off that kind of preparation and, as you say, the, the mental battle, if you like, you know, you must have been really happy with that at the end of those games. Yeah, that, that race to me is, is one of the most important races I ever did. And I didn't win it. But, you know, when people talk to me about what races are special, that one changed my career if you like so you know the the world short course championships in the beginning that race kind of in the middle and then Manchester at the other end um it was as significant as any gold medal well let's let's move on to Manchester then given that you've, you've mentioned it here um obviously in the UK in England um at home games and uh were you looking forward to that? Now I'm, I've I've already been horribly wrong with one stat in this in this chat, so I'm going to hazard another <laughs> guess though. But right. I think possibly the only other home championships you competed in would have been the '93 Europeans. I, don't, I can't think of anything else. But no, yeah. that would have been it. So yeah. but, ah, there we go, success. But um, but you know, were you looking forward to having that competition at home? You know, in front of the home fans, and in, in, you know, in, in in an English city. Yeah, you know, when I first started my career, um, 
the, the guys used to talk about a home competition. I remember before Auckland, you know, they, they were talking about how cool it would be to have the competition in your home. And I was thinking, are you crazy? You know, we're going, we're going to New Zealand. That's way better than swimming at home. But actually, once, once you kind of have travelled a bit, then you really do appreciate what a home competition means. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was really looking forward to it. But I also was at this, um, at that point, um, 31. Um, so it's just, yeah. So I was kind of getting towards, I guess, the, the older and the, towards the end of my career. And then there were an awful lot of people who, when I'd broken my back in 96, had already said, you know, you're a bit old for a swimmer. So, um, you know, I still felt like I had something to prove, if only to the people who'd stood by me through my um, accident and through my recovery, um, because there had been a lot of people who, you know, sort of thought I should give up and would never make it back to where I had been. And, you know, and it had been, it had been a really tough to get myself back. So um, to, to be able to have friends and family every day that I was swimming at those Commonwealth Games was really special because, you know, I had, I'd got back and I was there and they could actually all be there, you know, the people who'd been around me, not just my mum and dad, but much wider circle, um, you know, could be there and, and kind of see what I'd been doing the last 20 nearly 20 years and you know what <laughs> you know the reasons why I'd been getting up early in the morning and the reasons why I'd missed family events and I'd missed going out and you know just have an understanding of of actually be there to understand you know what it was that that so drove me to do it for so long um and so yeah th there was lots of reasons it was became incredibly special to have um the games at home the Commonwealth Games at home yeah well, at home championships, and you talked about, you know, being in the first event in Victoria, and here we are in Manchester, event number one, day one, 200 metres freestyle. So you've won, yeah. you've won bronze and then silver. You know, how are you approaching that? I mean, did you want to, you know, you obviously you wanted to win, you wanted to complete the set, but, you know, how are you feeling being up in that first, that first event, you know, in a home it didn't, competition? Was there extra pressure on you? It, it didn't feel extra pressure in terms of how I was expected to do. I think I was ranked fifth in the Commonwealth going into into that race. So I didn't feel huge pressure to to win. But I do, you know, as part of a team and, and one of the experienced members of the team, I feel, you know, um, I know how important it is to get the team off to a good start and to get the ball rolling. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to I wanted to swim well. Um, right from the start but I you know I wasn't favorite so there wasn't that that same kind of pressure on on me externally I suppose that then I would be putting on myself um, I had a great heat um, swim and qualified fastest so you know from then I knew I've got I've got a shot I've got a chance here because um, I didn't feel like the Australians were particularly holding back I think John Rooney um, either qualified in eighth or she she was ninth and someone pulled out and she got into the final and I knew that she was always going to be a danger. Um, you know, she'd been world champion. So to have her in the race it always was going to be, you, you feel like she's going to be a problem. Um, but yeah, just, I, I think that it, it was, everything kind of came together. It was, it was the fact that it was at home and, um, you know, I, I like to prove myself. I like to prove myself to doubters. Um, so I'd given myself a great opportunity. Um, and it was almost a, a nothing to lose situation. So you, do you remember much about that final? I mean... I do, yeah. 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 I mean, how do you recall it going? Um, so I, I knew that it was, again, it was really important to me to... Um, to swim my race and my strength was the, was the back end. So I knew that I couldn't get overexcited and, and go out too hard because there were girls in that race that would finish way stronger than me, but there were also girls that could go out a, a lot faster. And I just had to be careful not to be dragged into that battle and just be really focused on my lane and what I needed to do. I had a really good solid um, first hundred and then picked up on the third 50 um, and 
I remember coming down the final 50 and I was breathing to my right and I was leading and I remember thinking, my God, I'm going to win this. Um, And that that switch of focus to that instead of what I was doing almost cost me the race because Karen Legg was finishing really strong. And um, that just that moment of losing focus could have actually cost cost me. But I just remember looking, thinking, oh, my God, you know, I'm going to win this. Um, and thankfully I did. <laughs> well, you mentioned Karen, obviously she took the silver. So was it, was that, yeah. you know, being at home, England won two on the, that must've been a really special presentation. Yeah, it was because, you know, we'd had some great battles at, at nationals, um, you know, even district level, all sorts. We've had some amazing races, but we're also teammates, you know, so for me, the fact that she was swimming really well just meant brilliant. You know, our relay later in the week is looking really good. <clears throat> so I wanted her to swim well, but, you know, just a tiny bit slower than me in the individual. <laughs> so it was, it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, you went from that and, and you talked about backing up in, in Victoria, but you had you know, to do the same thing here. You went straight from, from there to the 100 free. Had, had you kind of yeah. learned from your previous experience about how to kind of come down and get yourself ready for, for the next swim? Yeah, I, I mean, I did. It was I was much better and much better prepared. I was much better at, um, you know, nutrition wise recovery. We had physios um, and we had physiologists. So there were lots of people that were looking after me. I regularly had problems with my legs after I swam um, in that I couldn't walk I would lose I, I didn't have any blood in my feet they would go completely white when all the blood would rush to my head so if I got out of the pool too soon I would just keel over um, so the physios were really good at, at helping to, me to recover particularly if I had back-to-back races um, you know they knew you know just just how to get get me back so um, I was definitely better, but I was also, you know, in my 30s and backing up races, including 200s, is always going to be tougher in your 30s than it is in your 20s, unfortunately. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, the, um, the the program wasn't the kindest in the way that it arranged the events because the, the 100 no. free final and then the 4 by 2 were in the same session, which presumably yeah. was not ideal, uh, given everything you've just said. But um, if we no, talk about not, that 4 by 2 Yeah. Um, the, obviously, you no, know, there'd been all the, the kerfuffle the year before in, in Fukuoka with, with the, the four by two, um, Australia yeah. had three quarters of the same team, um, yourself and Karen were on the England team. Um, you know, was there this kind of feeling of, well, we want to kind of beat them again to show that, you know, all that, that business last year was irrelevant or, you know, did it affect your approach or your, your thinking about that race or was it completely relevant? Definitely. No, definitely. It had a massive impact on us because not not so much us thinking we've, you know, we have to prove that we rightfully won that race. You know, to me, that race was done. Two teams were disqualified. We got the gold. I think there was some bad feeling from Australia because there was footage of team teams celebrating um, when Australia were disqualified. And they there's there has since and, and at the time there was um, talk that that was the British team but it wasn't actually it was the Swedish team um so we because we just didn't we weren't on the pool side so we weren't jumping around on the pool side so there was there was a bit of um bad feeling which you know incorrectly so towards um the British team um and there was you know a lot of again all the chat in the the papers that you know they they were the best team in the world and they were going to prove it and they were going to show us and all the rest of it and, you know we we just said look you know, this is our pool. We're not going to roll over. Um, we're going to do everything we can to to prove that we're a good team and that um, and to win in a, in our home pool. Karen and I were swimming well, and then we had um, Georgie Lee, who was the two hundred fly swimmer, and Joe Fargus, who was the two hundred backstroker. So it was a slightly unknown as as to what we'd be able to do. But Georgie had um, had been having a great meet. She got a medal in the two hundred fly. And then Jo actually pulled out of her backstroke race to concentrate on the relay. She felt that she had the best chance in the relay and she wanted to to focus on that. So Karen and I had both swam the 100 and I think Georgie had swam another race that session as well. Possibly the 100 fly, I can't remember now. 
and then I know two of the Australian team had also raced in the same session. So, you know, you, you never quite know how you're going to recover. Um, I was on the physio bed until we were called up for the race, just, um, you know, getting my legs massaged and getting ready. But in that kind of environment, you know, there was only 4,000 spectators at the pool in Manchester, but it, it was so loud. It, it felt like 40,000. Um, the noise was deafening and the atmosphere and, you know, we, we were never a group of swimmers to, to roll over. So it was a bring it on. Well, it was a it was a, a really close race throughout. I mean, it only had had mm -hmm. the four teams in it, but there was you know, yourselves and Australia and, and Canada kind of nip and tuck all the yeah. way through. You actually went in fractionally ahead at the, at the last changeover with with Patria Thomas yeah. uh, anchoring for for Australia. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you've talked about your, your your second half of your race and liking to chase and so on. So, I mean, would you yeah. prefer to go in point one behind her rather than point one in front of her? Um, not really. And with Patria, it, it, it didn't matter because Patria was going to go out really hard. That's that's the way she raced. And she and I had raced each other quite a few times. And what was interesting was she was the swimmer who jumped in early a year before and got the team disqualified. So, you know, she she had quite a lot of stake um, and I mean, she's one hell of a swimmer. So but I knew she was going to take the race out because that's the way she does it. She's just grit, gritty gutsy strong powerful she was going to go out hard so I knew at the halfway mark I wouldn't be leading if it was close I think the biggest gap in the whole of that race was about 0.24 of a second between the two teams you know so the whole way through but the one thing that the English team did really well was we we got on the wall every single time at the takeover first as I remember so we were finishing really well um, the race is ready, you know, and then everyone was able to swim their race without having that sense of chasing. So I knew that as soon as we dived in, you know, she was going to go and um, she was ahead by 50 um, and, you know, ahead of me at 100. Um, and so the, the key thing for me really was to not go with her, was to, I didn't want to let her get too far ahead, you know, I didn't want like that elastic to break, but I knew I, I couldn't go with her. So although it was, I remember being like the adrenaline and the nerves and, and that's again it's just what I loved about going on the end of a relay um that that feeling um I just loved it um and I you know I remember coming up to the hundred and the whole time I'm just thinking you know just wait 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 stay relaxed stay relaxed stay relaxed and then coming into that turn I knew that I had to then give it absolutely everything that third 50 was my 50 that's where I had to turn on the pace so I absolutely belted that third 50 um, and I pulled past her and went into the final turn ahead of her. Um, but I was absolutely battered. Like my arms and legs were screaming as I went into that last turn. Um, but when you're when you're that close to someone in a race, like side by side, you can sense how someone is. So I, I knew I had to not let her know any way that I was really struggling. So I had to have the best final turn I could possibly have. And then if she had any sort of sense that, you know, that I wasn't getting my fly kicks off the wall or had a slow turn, she would be all over it. So I knew I had to make her think that I still had something in the tank. I couldn't give her any psychological advantage. Um, I know I gritted my teeth because at the end of the race, my jaw ached. And I also remember coming out of the turn the first time that I breathed to my um, left, I could see the whole of the England team or the St. George flags because they were we were seated in, in that in that deep end or that second half of the, <clears throat> the lane. That's where the England team were off the turn. And I remember just turning and just seeing the England flag and hearing the noise. Um, and then it was just a case of pride down the, the final length. Um, and I was in the most pain I've ever been in in a race that I can remember. Um, I've been like that in training where I almost feel like I'm outside of my body watching my body swim. Um, and it's dark and it's painful. And I remember just being like that down that, that final 25 metres. Um, just absolutely teeth gritted everything hurting like crazy just wanting to get to the wall it was painful well you, you, <laughs> you made it to the wall first obviously yeah uh, and then you took the gold medal but you know 
people will remember when the you know, watching on the TV, you know, you were absolutely spent. You know, it was quite yeah. clear. Everything you just said, you know, reinforces that. But, you know, that were you able to kind of celebrate at all inwardly, or is it just, you know, the effort? <laughs> It took me a while. You, you know. I think I hung on the wall for quite a while. Um, the pain that I have in my legs is like someone taking two knives and just ripping them down the back of my legs. Um, that That's the pain that I, I was feeling at the end of the race because the blood just shoots from my legs up, up to my head and my heart to just, um, yeah, survival, I guess. So, th- yeah, I was in absolute agony just hanging onto the wall while this pain was in, in my legs. And then after, I don't know how long, I I'm kind of remember punching the air and I remember the girls going crazy on the poolside and um, they were saying, like, climb out. And I was just saying, I can't, I can't walk. I can't use my legs. I can't walk. So when they did get me out, they had to carry me to the interview with Sharon Davis because my legs, I had just had no feeling in them at all. It was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a you got a you got a deserved day off after that one. I'm pleased to say, you know, you didn't have to race the <laughs> I next. I can't day. remember anything after that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but that that was it, that was so special um, because on paper we shouldn't have won that race, you know. On, and it's just, it just kind of just goes to prove that sometimes you know everything comes together. There were four people who really wanted something, um, you know the. Joe gave up a different race to to be part of that relay and we all worked really hard for each other to make it happen. Well, uh, teamwork in, indeed. And, uh, you know, the, the, the 4 by one team uh, also did, did the business with a, with a silver medal. So you, you left those games with, a, with two golds and a silver to, to add to your collection. Is there anything else that, that stands in, out in the memory for, for Manchester? Oh, so many things. Um, I carried the flag at the closing ceremony and it rained, of course. (laughs) Um, But that was pretty special. In fact, Manchester was the only opening ceremony of the Commonwealth or Olympics that I'd ever been to because of um, the swimming was in the second half. Unusually, um, athletics had to move because of their European championships, I think it was. So we got to do an opening ceremony, which was amazing um, and great, you know, for out of the eight games that I did in my career it's the uh, the only one that I got to as an athlete um and just it was amazing I mean I remember just getting on the bus to go to the pool sometimes not on the team bus we just get get on the bus um from the the um, accommodation to get to the pool and the people were just brilliant the people were great the support was amazing coming out of the pool after sessions you know so many people were waiting um to to meet meet the athletes and um you know, the swim team was having a great meet to to kind of you know just just adds to everything there were some some superb swims um yes um and getting to go and watch again some other sport after a couple of um events i was able to to get to not much because we were at the end but it it's um it was just it's manchester will manchester pool will always be really special well, I think that's a good time to uh, to draw a line under these these recollections. So, Karen, really enjoyed hearing your thoughts and your and your memories. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Amazing to hear all those stories from Karen. So, thank you again to her for sharing. Uh, you can find more memories of games past, including more podcasts, at poolboy.co.uk forward slash memories if you want to find out some more. Uh, if you want to get in touch, find me on social media at poolboy on Twitter or at poolboy UK on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, do leave a review, please. That would uh, be really appreciated. Uh, we'll be back with more soon. So thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Pool Boy podcast. For more episodes, visit www.poolboy.co.uk slash podcast.